Thank you very much. Uh, you've already seen some fantastic OCT imaging uh, from uh, uh, Apex and, and Dr. Akasaka's expertise is, is uh, second to none. Uh, so uh, today we'll uh, talk a little bit more about incorporating OCT in real world practice. I have no conflicts or disclosures of interest. So in general, there are four reasons to consider OCT. The first two are obvious, and we've discussed this morning. How tight is the lesion? Should we stent it? And second, how does our acute stent result look? Are there edge dissections? What's the expansion? Uh, is, what's the haziness due to? Is there a concern that needs more attention? I will point out that there is a randomized trial ongoing, the Illumion 4 trial, which is evaluating angio-guided versus OCT-guided stenting. And the results will be coming out in 2021, I believe. That'll be very interesting to see if OCT makes a difference in terms of clinical outcomes to PCI. But today I thought I'd show some cases and, uh, and uh, discuss the other two reasons to consider OCT. Number one, evaluation of stent failure. And number two, the final one there is to go back one step and say, what is the etiology of the acute coronary syndrome and does that impact our management? Let's start with a case of stent failure. This is a 75-year-old uh, uh, patient female from uh, toward the end of last year, three, ang uh, three anginal agents, positive stress test, and she had a bare metal stent uh, nearly 20 years ago for unstable angina. And here's her angiograms, her old one on the left and the new one on the right with a white arrow pointing to bare metal stent, instant restenosis, 70-80%. It's not obviously a, a, a complex lesion here. It looks like a very straightforward lesion. In fact, I'm sure you're thinking, gosh, we can be done in two or three minutes. Well, here's the OCT. This is a pre-evaluation prior to intervention, and you'll see the imaging catheter here. You see the stents all the way around here. So it's a very well-expanded stent. This is not a case of late stent under expansion. But you see the tissue here is very heavily calcified, and we can tell calcium on OCT. This is one type of calcium. You see this darker heterogeneous material with the ill-defined borders, suggesting this is deep calcific tissue uh, restenosis. Now I know you're looking at that and you're thinking just what I'm thinking. Why are you wasting time? Just go ahead and balloon and stent it. So despite seeing this calcium, we thought, well, let's just go ahead and balloon it. And the balloon was non-dilatable at 28 plus atmospheres. So the next question is, how are you going to manage this? Are you going to laser or rotor? Maybe we have a show of hands. How many people would take laser here? And how many people would go with rotor? So majority would go with what we did, which is rotor. We did 1.75 and 2.0, and it was still non-dilatable, despite 2.0 rotational atherectomy. So then went and did laser with uh, contrast, and it was still non-dilatable. Now what to do? Any offers from the moderators? We don't have uh, mamas. We don't have IV, uh, the lithotripsy here. We don't have the OP uh, N balloon. Uh, so well, we were pretty stuck. So we went with a bigger balloon, a four millimeter balloon. This was a 3.0 stent, and the balloon burst at 14 atmospheres. And with that balloon burst, we got lucky. The stent would then expand. So this used a combination of rotor, laser, and balloon burst to get the stent open. But the OCT told us at the beginning that this was going to be a complex case. This is another case, a 42-year-old female who was fit with no risk factors, and she had a V-fib arrest. She's a hockey teacher. She collapsed while she was holding the door open of the bus as they were going to a hockey match. And there was an AED nearby. They got her resuscitated. She went to the emergency room and was feeling fine. Her ECG shows anterior STT wave changes, and her angiogram shows this, a mid-LAD lesion um, here. And I'm sure, again, we're all thinking, gosh, why are you wasting time talking about this? Put a dual antiplatelet therapy stat in and put in a drug eluting stent. Well, we were getting interested in causes of uh, uh, ACS, and particularly in this female who had no risk factors. This was her OCT. Again, the imaging catheter and the wire here. And the key uh, point here is that in the lumen, there is nothing. This is a completely normal vessel lumen. There's no atherosclerotic plaque. The abnormality is, is so obvious that it's actually hard to see. It's this huge, great big collection of intramural hematoma. So this is a compressive narrowing of the LAD due to huge intramural hematoma or spontaneous coronary artery dissection. When we talk about spontaneous dissection these days, we must remember the majority of spontaneous dissections do uh, uh, have an intramural hematoma associated with it. So in this particular case, the OCT helped us to avoid a stent because we know with conservative therapy, this will heal in the absence of intervention.
a few points on sp a spontaneous dissection because we're all seeing a lot more of it these days. It's an acute coronary syndrome that can present in a high-risk manner. It's non-atherosclerotic. It typically affects middle-aged females. The average age is probably the upper 40s and postpartum in about 8%. The key associations are firstly a very low prevalence of atherosclerotic risk factors. If you have a patient who is diabetic, hypertensive, you can tell even before the angiogram it's not spontaneous dissection. These patients are all typically very fit. But the principal association, uh, and I have to give credit to the femoral operators, because without the femoral operators we would not have discovered this association. This of course is a sheath angiogram, and the key association is this. It is fibromuscular dysplasia that is present in about 50 to 80% of patients when you screen them with CT angiogram. And this is a very, very strong association with spontaneous dissection. And we've learned, all of us here in this room have learned over the last few years that we've been under-recognizing spontaneous dissection. And that imaging has helped us pick up more of these uh, uh, over the last, I would say, five or six years. And the reasons for under uh, recognition is firstly we assume everything is atherosclerosis. This is a 50 year old female who had an ACS and I think a few years ago we might have called this normal coronary arteries or minimal atherosclerosis here and the proximal LAD. But if you evaluate this with OCT you see this is the left main bifurcation here, the catheter, and the abnormality is this tiny blip over here. Now, you may not believe me that that's the abnormality, and I think you would be right to mistrust that. How can I say this tiny blip over here is abnormal? Well, if you go to the next frame, you see how this blip has now evolved into this crescent, and we go one further frame down, and the whole vessel is surrounded by intramural hematoma, causing a compressive, relatively minor narrowing. So this is spontaneous dissection and intramural hematoma of the proximal LAD. A second reason for, for, for misrecognition of SCAD is we've, we call things spasm. This is a patient who had uh, transient ST changes and, and torsade de pointe, and you see a diffusely narrowed LAD that we might have called normal or spasm, but if we evaluate with OCT, we see again this huge collection of intramural hematoma causing a compressive, diffuse narrowing of the LAD. Now it's important that now that we're recognizing more spontaneous dissection that we don't over-diagnose it and many times uh, that is a risk. Here's a couple of cases, a 40-year-old female on the left, a 37-year-old female on the right. One of these is spontaneous dissection. And I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Uh, hands up for number one, spontaneous dissection. Hands up for number two. Okay, most of you are right. So this first case is 40-year-old female. Uh, she came in with an inferior myocardial infarction. And um, the movie is not working here. We'll try and see if it works here. Cannot play media. Anyway, she had that lesion that I showed you in the still frame. Um, and, and she had aspiration thrombectomy of there, this lesion here, and had an OCT. And the OCT was completely normal. Trivial, trivial plaque here and a tiny amount of thrombus over here. So this tells us this was, despite her risk factors, this was not a plaque rupture event. In fact, because of that, we searched for an embolus and found here uh, thrombus in the interatrial septum moving across. This is not uh, playing. Just, just, yeah. this hmm. All of them, uh, all the movies are not playing. This is the uh, was the embolic source of a myocardial infarction over here, moving across the intraatrial septum here. But back to that very first case, the hockey teacher. Why does making the diagnosis matter? Why don't we just go ahead and put in the stent? Well, we know that spontaneous dissection uh, revealed by OCT has a high risk of PCI complications. This is one example of a dissection of the proximal right coronary artery. Here's the intramural hematoma and the intimal tear causing connection with the lumen. And this was stented, and look what's happened. The flow has now gone. What had happened is the stent has squished, pushed that intramural hematoma downstream and caused compressive narrowing, chasing the vessel downstream and causing a narrowing. So we went from TIMI-3 flow to now TIMI-1 flow because of displacement of intramural hematoma. Here's another example of a complication. We see the LAD here as a long, diffuse segment of spontaneous dissection. And I'm going to show you this guiding catheter, and here's the wire. Look at the tip of the wire here. 
and put yourself in the mind of the operator and you're thinking this operator is not quite sure where that tip of the wire is and they were right to question it because the tip of the wire was in a false lumen and unfortunately stents were placed and they were placed in the false lumen so now these stents have sealed the true lumen and we've caused a big anterior myocardial infarction because of an under recognition of spontaneous dissection. On the other hand, here's a case of a two-vessel dissection affecting the LAD and the subtuse marginal, and this patient was managed conservatively, and three months later there was near complete healing of both of the vessels. And this recognition of increased risk of PCI complications and positive outcomes with conservative therapy has led to a, a push toward more conservative management of spontaneous dissection here. So I'm going to go on that final case, the one that most of you voted for was spontaneous dissection, and the OCT confirms that. Here's the lumen, and here's the big intramural hematoma causing diffuse narrowing. How many people would manage this with bypass surgery? Hands up. How many with PCI? A couple of people. And how many conservative therapy? Okay. So most people said conservative therapy, and that's what happened. The patient was managed conservatively. Uh, but six days later, came back with a huge anterior MI. So the LAD has now occluded. There's now a near total occlusion of the left main here. Big anterior myocardial infarction. So what had happened is the dissection had evolved and caused worse narrowing and caused complete occlusion. So conservative therapy is not always safe in spontaneous dissection. I think that's a key message uh, uh, that we've learned. And here's some, some data that we just published showing that in a series of uh, 240 patients who were managed conservatively, there is a one in six risk of much worsening over the next few days. The highest risk is in the first two or three days, and the risk burns out after one week. But there is this high risk. And who is at risk? Well, patients who have an intramural hematoma alone. If there's an intimal dissection visible, these patients are protected from worsening. And the second observation was that intramural hematoma precedes the development of intimal dissection. So in spontaneous dissection, we've now learned from OCT and other studies that intramural hematoma comes first, causes compressive narrowing of the vessel, and then in some patients, this hematoma will decompress into the lumen. So when you see the intimal dissection, it is a secondary phenomenon, not a primary phenomenon, and it is protective against worsening. So if, you, if we see an intimal dissection now, we'll leave this alone. So to conclude, uh, insights from OCT, we use it frequently for acute stent optimization and evaluation of late stent failure, but I would encourage the earlier use in trying to understand mechanisms of acute coronary syndrome because it does impact treatment and it does help us further understanding of disease processes. And with that, I'll thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, Rajiv. Uh, Samir, maybe you want to ask something, please. Yeah, so Rajiv, uh, is there any role of proactively creating a dissection at the first uh, catheterization in order for it to be allowed to decompress over time? Yeah, th th thanks, Samir. So, so should we fenestrate and decompress the lumen? There are certainly case reports out there of cutting balloons that have used to decompress the hematoma with success. It's not been studied systematically. I will say that it takes very, very little to disrupt that. You don't need a blade. Even a wire or a low-pressure balloon will disrupt that lesion. And I would say if the vessel is occluded, then for sure I would use a balloon alone, uh, a fenestrate, restore flow, and not put in the stent. But when you have TIMI-3 flow, and we know that five in six will heal well, it's difficult to know whether we should be balloon fenestrating those or not. Um, but it does work, and it doesn't need a cutting balloon. So, uh, which kind of hematoma is to be treated? Are there any, any criteria this should be treated with a cutting balloon or kind of balloon? Or TIMI flow or something like that? I'm sorry, say that again? Yeah, any, any guidance by the OCT is, uh, that such kind of hematoma is to be treated or should be left alone? Any criteria? It's a great question, and I don't know is the short answer to your question. Um, uh, because there's just so few of these, there'll never be a randomized trial to decide which way to treat this. I still think if the flow is normal, then conservative therapy is probably appropriate. But if you're going to intervene, OCT will help guide maybe where the most uh, attractive spot is to do the balloon angioplasty. Thank yes, you. Rajiv, a short question, uh, Rajiv. Uh, 
Uh, recent meta-analysis has shown that uh, OCT-guided PCI was associated with a better clinical outcome compared to angiographic-only guided PCI. So do you suggest that we should do the OCT in all of the interventions or only in selected cases like left main stenting or long lesion or bifurcation stenting? What are your comments? Yeah, it's a great question for debate. Uh, and I think every imaging randomized trial uh, shows that imaging is associated with better outcomes. Certainly most of the data is with IVUS. And it also, these observational studies show that most of us underutilized imaging. The question whether OCT will be better than angio-guided is being addressed in a randomized trial, the Illumion 4 trial, and I think it will be very interesting to see the findings. I know in my practice, I, I, I never regret doing a study. You always learn something, and not infrequently you learn something that changes your management. Um, but I think the short answer to your question is we have to wait and see what the randomized trial shows. Rajiv, question uh, uh, is... LED that you showed it, uh, proximal LED, we should never leave it alone like that. Uh, you have no choice but to treat. How would you treat that? The, the, uh, I would have still treat it conservatively, to be honest. It was the no, wrong... No, but that patient came back, right, uh, with yeah. the disaster. So you have no choice. You have to treat. How yeah. would you treat that? I'm going to shrug my shoulders and say, I don't know. I, what I will say is that we know that uh, a bypass surgery is associated with very good acute outcomes. In the 25 or so patients that has been studied, they do well. The surgeons can get the graft on, the, on distally and the patients do well, but we also know is that most of those grafts will close and fail down the line because the vessel will heal, there'll be competitive flow. So bypass surgery will get you out of trouble, but it won't protect you in the long term. Right, but uh, in this situation, you are not sending to bypass surgery, but you have no choice but to treat. How would you treat Well, this? you do have a choice. I mean, you can still treat them conservatively. So we observe all our patients in hospital for five to seven days. I see. As one of the reasons we do that is because of the risk of deterioration. I still think conservative therapy is probably the preferred option. I think the next case is ready, so we have to stop the lecture. And thanks.